Hello, welcome to Mark Langley's Horsemanship Podcast, a podcast helping people to understand their horses better, to provide solutions in a calm, connected way. I'm Jenny Barnes. And I'm Mark Langley. Now, the 2024 clinics have just been released and uh, they've been sort of going gangbusters. It's been quite fun to sort of um, watch people get quite excited about them coming out. Um, how are you feeling about next year? Oh, really good about next year, yeah. Um, there's a few changes, a few life changes that we're making. And uh, so it's, you know, it's going to be an exciting year. Um, yeah, looking looking forward to it again. And uh, yeah, so... So yeah, oh, yeah. And, and and the clinics have been filling up quite fast. So that's it's 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 really nice to know that people sort of believe in me that much. And yeah, so that's good. <clears throat> yeah, they're almost um, almost all full actually for the entire year, Mark. So you're doing really well. Uh, and they include, of right. course, a young horse starting clinic, which is really exciting for people who've been wanting to get their young ones to you for quite a while. Before this, we've only been able to offer the, the longer clinics, back to back sort of scenarios, which people have been bringing their horses to and working through and um, that's been going well but this is specifically for for young horses isn't it yeah yeah so um it's hard to sort of plan a young horse start because sometimes you want you want you don't want people and the horses there for a long time and and it's you know people have got to take time off so we've sort of done a, a you know 10 day one and I'm just hoping in that 10 days we can sort of make some good changes that people can carry on when they get home and obviously every horse is going to be different but um it's uh you know the horses might go home completely you know started but they're going to be pretty you know getting some good um ideas and foundation in there to sort of you know keep going with and 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 you know really progress in the starting process yeah that's right that that solid foundation that they can just go go confidently forward mm. with um, I've got a, I'm just going to read you a comment that's come through from a couple of people who live in Texas and they just wanted to let you know that their horses have made such strides since starting to work with your methods on the online membership and completing the challenge. They've got 51 years of intensive experience working with horses, so they're not exactly greenhorn, but they say thank you for all your hard work in challenging us to examine their long-held beliefs and practices. They're on an entirely new journey that has taken them to levels of research and understanding of horse behaviour that they couldn't have started without you as the catalyst. And that's from Dr. and Mrs. Edmondson. So thank you for that comment coming through. It's great to hear. Today, we're going to guide you through um, for, for those of you listening, how to help stressed horses. So stay with us. This is quite a few questions in this session that have come through from our online members. And they're going to cover a wide range of situations, some practical situations from feet to chewing, catching and floating. And then we're going to look at the theory of internalizing stress and how we can help that and what it looks like. So Mark, we'll start off with a question that's come through from Chrissy. And we'll start with the uh, with the feet. Nice sort of practical one for you to keep going today. And Chrissy has a horse um, who should just like some tips. It's a young gelding. He's only 19 months old. He's happy to give his feet, but he'll often snatch them back. She thinks it's because he feels unbalanced. When she tries to handle his feet, she often gives his foot back to him if, she, if he gets tense. But the farrier will hold on while he pulls. And sometimes he'll lean to the point where he almost lays down. She's wondering, is she making it worse for the farrier by giving his foot back as soon as he starts to tense up? Um, poss possibly, yes, uh, because, you know, whatever behaviour we reward, um, we can reinforce. So if a horse gets a little stressed with his foot and he starts to sort of fight a little bit and then, and then you sort of, you know, it's almost like saying, oh, my hand's stuck oh, I've just freed it up. So basically by giving it back, you can give him the feeling that he's freed up from that trap. So so then he's going to start to possibly believe that picking the foot up is more of a trap because the more the horse thinks, oh, that's a bad idea to hold my foot there, I'm going to free up from that, then they believe it's a trap because they haven't actually committed to that till till they become soft and comfortable with it. And it's only when a horse becomes comfortable with whatever you're asking and and they kind of emotionally not not submit to it, but they kind of yield to it in an emotional way that they're they're they're, they're confident and they're happy there that that basically they start to recognise that it's not a trap. So 
uh, whenever a horse braces, whenever it fights, whenever it throws its head, whenever it reefs, reefs the foot out of your hand, uh, and, and, and they get released from that, in a sense, they can be rewarding themselves and reinforcing the fact that it's dangerous. Um, <clears throat> so, but sometimes holding onto a horse until they sort of, um, you know, sometimes it can be a wrestle and you can frighten the horse more by holding it uh, for, for a long time with a big fight. So you kind of don't, you, you know, you don't want to sort of start something that you end up stressing the horse more because you've held onto the foot for too long. So you've also got to be careful when you hold the foot for a long time. So um, I would tend to, uh, and this subject came up actually just at, at, uh, at this clinic actually that I'm at now um, at Benalla in Victoria and the little horse that the lady's got, he snatches his foot, uh, you know, at a certain time. So well, what we did is we worked on how well does he lead first. So basically I just got under his chin and led him and, and this is what I'm going to sort of, you know, encourage you to sort of look into is get your horse to lead soft move them across, move the hind quarter over, get them really supple that you can just get them to loosen their body really nice, loosen all their feet in the lead rope and just lead really nicely um, because that's all part of the um, the confidence in balancing because you don't want a horse that's kind of bracy standing there and you're taking a foot and they feel like they're on three legs but they still need that leg because they're out of balance. So by getting a horse to sort of move very quietly, very softly, um, and not go very far is teaching them that they can loosen all their feet and be really balanced. And also what that does is helps them to soften their legs that when you start to pick them up, the legs are a lot softer. So we did a fair bit of that. And, and the other thing we also did, because some horses are still, they still haven't got used to us being down their sides and they, they might be, we think they're okay with it. Maybe they're, they're only sort of accepting it when they're standing still, but then when we pick up their feet, they get a bit more frightened. So you want to have the horse accepting you down the sides whilst it's moving. So, you know, I, I, uh, with this little horse, we, we, after we'd loosened up the feet, uh, in, in the sense of got the leading really soft, um, I just got him to lead by a little bit and, and get him to lead his feet to me. So basically if I'm standing still, I might stand still like I'm, like I was standing on a mounting block or something that I can't move off. And I just get them to lead by until they can softly bring the front foot to me, the hind foot to me, and all that sort of thing. Uh, so, so then you're addressing how they're moving beside you, because movement beside you and soft movement is a good indicator that your horse can move beside you and not sort of go, oh, "I'm worried moving beside you" and things like that. So, what you do there is you, you know, you get them moving beside you, and then when they're soft at that then you might just go down the feet and sometimes I walk them and I try and reach out and rub their legs while they're walking, while they're standing, while they're walking, until I, every foot's been rubbed and touched and every leg's been rubbed and touched whilst, it, whilst they're moving. And I've addressed how they're moving, if they're moving in a flinchy way, if they're moving, you know, if they're sort of um, getting worried while I'm rubbing them when they're moving and then they freeze. So basically if they're freezing every time I touch the leg when they're moving, then that's an indicator that I've got to keep working with that until they can move softly and there's no freeze in them. So then they're standing softly, I can handle all their legs. Another thing I'll go around and do is just get, get the leg to yield, just yield a little bit so they've taken their weight off their, their leg and they'll go around and do that with all their legs. Uh, so just, just underneath their fetlock, you just pick up until they just rock, rock their foot off the ground a little bit and just you know, take the weight off that leg and I get them to soften every leg. If they don't soften every leg and they're having a bit, of, I'm having a bit of trouble, I can always go back to the knot and just loosen them up and get them to rebalance through, through, through the lead rope uh, on their head and loosen them up again. And then the other thing I'd also do is, is starting to get them to uh, just put a, a, a looped rope around their, around their fetlock and just get them to soften their foot to a rope and just get them to lead those feet. Um, <clears throat> and then... Basically, uh, what you can do then is start to, once they can soften every foot, then they're actually softening their foot and not using it to balance on. Then you pick it up and you might go, you know, 10 seconds or yeah, even shorter than that sometimes, pick it up, hold, put the foot down, interrupt the horse's thoughts with a little kind of lead. So you've actually, the horse has not just started to, started to distract itself, it's you, you've got into it and sort of said, hey, can you think about this? Then you might pick up the foot again. Um, hold it for a little longer, put the foot down, interrupt his thoughts a little bit. So basically the idea is you're interrupting that horse's thoughts 
um, asking for some sort of connection and some sort of question. Because what usually happens is when you've got a foot up, they start to look away, look away, look away, and then they need that foot to go towards their thoughts. So you're basically trying to get them very present and very soft in, in that position so they're, they're, they're engaged with you and um, uh, not not destinating, things like that. So so basically, yeah, you you just do that and you hold the foot longer, but you, you want to be sort of... But then what you start to do as you hold them longer and you start to feel that sort of, I may take my foot away... You, you, you know, especially with the front feet, you can do this, but you can also do it with the hind feet if you've got the, the rope in a position where you're still holding the rope when you're holding the hind feet. You get them so good at yielding their thoughts a little bit when you pick up a feel on that rope that as soon as they start to get a little distracted, you can put a little feel in that rope and they can go, oh, right, uh, let go of that thought, come back to centre, you know, be present. And then they're not thinking away and needing that foot to go away. So basically, sometimes they need that extra foot to support their thoughts, and if their thoughts are in the right position, then they don't need that foot. So, so that's also what you want to look at. And then when your horse is softer, then you've got more of a chance that you can hold the foot a little longer if the horse does get a little wriggle up. But if they get a wriggle up, try and interrupt their thoughts with that rope, like I said, and, and you might catch them a little earlier instead of just trying to wrestle the foot until they sort of, you know, either panic or... Um, you. I've ha had to hold sometimes young horses' feet and I've got away with holding it till they've softened there. But, but as I say, if it goes wrong, then you, you've sort of made, the, made it worse potentially. So it sounds like you've got to um, try and get the horse in, a, in an emotional sort of calm state as, as much as possible before you even pick those yeah. feet up. And, of course, all that leading helps. Yeah. Because yeah. They're one, one of my biggest, yeah. Yeah, one of my biggest learning curves was uh, go back and get the horse in the right frame of mind for learning and then go back to what you were doing and, and you find that sometimes that, that's enough to fix it yeah that, that's gold isn't it there you go okay so next question mark is about catching um so this is from hermini who um works in the mounted police i'll say that because this i always i just find it fascinating what she does but she has a clydesdale mare um at work who's somewhat sharp she says who's quite difficult to catch and she's looking at advice on how she can address this. What happens is this mare hides behind other horses when a person tries to approach her and she'll switch sides as the person does and then she'll swing her hindquarters around and try to kick the person trying to catch her. She has kicked a few people now um, and particularly tries to kick the ones who are perhaps less um, experienced with horses. If she goes out and um, she'll just use small movements and then hold when this mare faces her and wait, then she can go up and catch her. But if she moves in too quickly, then she'll try to kick. Um, mm. So she's quite pushy and distracted in her leading, um, which Hermini has also been working on. But yes, have you got any advice, Mark, to help with this sort of very difficult catching process that's going on? <clears throat> yeah, um, you might have to take her off the other horses for a little bit. Um, and look at how she can be caught without the other horses first because there's probably a lot of things in there that need need sorting out. Uh, and in the other horses, it's going to be hard because you've got all these other horses she can hide behind and other horses that will stir up if you sort of need to do some things. So, um, like, there have been horses in mobs that I've had to go and catch in a paddock and because and, they've been uncatchable and I've just found the horse they like the most and catch that one first and... Uh, and then while I'm leading the other horse around, I'll be working working the horse that I initially I want to catch while I've got the horse that they like in my hand. Um, and, and you can get a lot done doing that. And, and, and you know, but I'd say in your situation with her, I, I definitely, you have the ability to move her. Like, I mean, you can catch her. Um, but when you approach her, sometimes what I would start to do is I'd approach her with a normal... I'm walking with a certain amount of energy towards you as in just a normal walk. And I know some people question this. I had a, uh, um, you know, a, a little video on Facebook recently and, and, and a comment was as well, if I, if, if I saw someone approaching me like that, I would be braced. And, well, that's the whole point of me approaching the horse with quite a bit of energy because a lot of horses interpret that as this is a threat, here comes a threat, I'm worried, I'm going to run away or I'm going to 
defend myself or, or whatever. So then nobody can ever catch the horse when they're in just a bit of a normal walk or a bit of a hurry because the horse sees it as, oh, do they want to chase me? Are they after me? So, so we have to be able to walk to our horses uh, in a normal or fast way if we're in a hurry and the horse doesn't feel threatened by that and goes, actually, hey, they come, they're running to me in a hurry, I might come to them and meet them because them running to me is not threatening. So, you know, that's how we have to think about. So, so if you had her on her own and you're going to walk up to her quite, quite normal without doing all the sort of I'm listening to every sort of signal that she gives you, she's going to go, whoa, and she's going to sort of think away and she's going to, you know, first probably try and find a spot to sort of, you know, move off. And that's when you might do something big and distract her. And as soon as she sort of dis like gets that bit of a shock or distraction and turns around, you've just sort of walked off and you're doing something else. And then you approach again and she's going to get that hard thought and then she's going to either think away or she's going to turn and she's going to go, oh, what are you going to do? And she might get that aggressive, I'm going to stand my ground. Uh, but because you've approached her, because you've approached her fairly big, she'll most probably show you signs at a, a greater distance, which means you'll be free of getting kicked because you won't be in her air area. So basically it's when you, sn you sneak into them, then when you're that close, because you've snuck there, when something goes wrong, you're very close to them. But if you're walking in quite big, they're going to notice you further away and they're going to start doing all those things further away. So, so, so you, 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 you're safe because you're not in that area. You can, you can get um, kicked. So, so basically you, 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 you walk in, um, she does something, it, it's probably going to be a negative thing to you, but for her, it's, it's, it's how she's dealing with it. And as I say, you just ask her to let go of that thought, do something big enough to get her to let go of that thought, and then immediately you just soften and walk away. And then you approach again, and you just keep doing that approach until she has that hard thought, get her to let go of that thought, and then walk away again. And after a while, she'll recognise that you're not going in to grab her or anything like that. She shifts the thought, and then what'll what'll start to happen is she'll soften. And after so many goes of that, you might walk up to her and she'll have a, a soft thought, as in she'll kind of stay a little curious and she won't destinate or try and get angry. And then you might go, Well, I'll just stand here quietly, and she'll engage with you a little bit, and then you just walk away softly. And then you might approach her softly, just walk soft. And then because you've walked at her quite big and she's made a change, when you halve that intensity that's going to be like oh this is really easy and, then, and and there's there's i don't see any threat in them but because when you walk to them when you're big that'll also become not threatening either because you didn't really do anything you just got her to let go of a strong thought and then you left and if you keep doing that approach and retreat like that if she'll get to a point that she'll actually stay engaged with you and she might even walk up to you sometimes like you know as you soften and walk towards her and if, if she comes up and sniffs on you or anything, you just walk away again and just leave her. And then you go back again. You don't sort of go, right, good, now let's all be friends and don't stay in a space too long. Just touch and go, touch and go. And she's going to start to get curious and interested and, um, and, and then she'll, she'll see you in a whole different way. And I've had a lot of success with horses uh, that have been hardened through bad treatment in their past, bad training, drive and draw, you know, too much approach and retreat in the way that the person sneaks in like a cat stalk on a bird sort of thing, noticing every little sort of detail in the horse that the horse actually starts to control a person more than the horse actually empowering. It's, you know, become, it, opposed to the horse becoming more empowered and saying, oh, well, I can actually come up to you when you look like you're um, just walking to me normally. So, yeah, just give that a go for a little while and then uh, when she's back in the herd and you've done a bit of that, just go in and just hang around the other horses, you know, the ones she likes. Go and pat that one for a bit and maybe lead it around for a little bit and then if she's kind of engaging with you, maybe let a sniff on you, touch her and then walk away with the other horse and just be around the other horses without putting a lot of heat on her and, and, and she'll start to trust you when you're mingling around the horses and she'll start to, you know, so, you know sometimes seek you out a little bit in, in the horses and that's the, the horse in Germany years ago that, apparently couldn't be caught like you know he started seeking me out and going oh what are you doing over there um 
because I actually hung around all his friends, so he didn't have anyone to hide behind. So he thought, well, if I want to be in the cool club, I've got to maybe soften a bit and come over. Can you say a little bit about what happened to Jamie just really quickly? Because it was such a, such an amazing story, that one. Yeah, well, he was just a little uh, a little horse that, you know, he'd just run off out in the paddock and, and, you know, he'd run off in hand and stuff like that. But the the biggest thing I went to go and help him with is being caught from the herd. And so, yeah, all I really did is um is I just kind of went in and I found the horse that he liked, the one he hid behind the most, and I just spent a bit of time with that one and um, basically I'd, I'd just walk around that one and uh, every time he'd pay attention to me a little bit, I'd just kind of wander away. So I just kind of, as I was with that other horse, I'd just go around and, you know, he, he couldn't go too far from that horse. That was the funny thing. He was always drawn back because he didn't want to be out on his own. So, um, you know, I just would do little things to interrupt his thought and then, then he'd, he'd sort of draw his thoughts across to me and then, you know, I just go around and do something else and come back again, and then and then he started to soften, and and then when he realised that, oh, you know, he couldn't really hide because I was with his, the, the one that he wanted to hide behind. He sort of he sort of gave up on that idea, and then I could approach him, touch him, and walk away. And basically, I did a lot of approach, touch, don't expect anything of him, walk away, until till he sort of started to um, not get in that habit of of just seeing a person and hiding. And once he recognised that, you know, he could engage with me and, and, and it wasn't a big deal, um, then and then he got a lot better. But the things that happen after that are so important because if you, if you, if you put a holder on a horse and train them in a way that doesn't make them feel good or they would get left feeling bad, well, all that catching work just goes out the window because they know what's coming when you're walking out with the halter into the, into the herd. So... So the follow-up work in getting a horse to feel good about being caught within a herd is, is, is so important. And, and this is where a lot of horses, you know, I say to people, work on number two before number one because the horse, the horse is troubled in number one because it's anticipating number two. So fix number two and number one will sort itself out. So, you know, that's also something that had to be rectified with that little horse is, is the training. He had, to, he had to start to make some good progress in training and feel good about it to to actually not feel, feel so bad when people come to catch him mm. okay all right um we'll move on to the next question that's from carly and it's sort of about um you know that process of catching in a sense as well because it's about getting the halter on she's got a 12 month old colt um, that she's only had for about four months. Um, he was always the very first to approach her and engage. He's very friendly and curious, but very mouthy, which can turn into a nip sometimes. He seems anxious with the halter going on and wants to bite it and chew on it when it goes over his nose. Um, he's improved with the rope or the halter end under his neck. And he had a soft cloth to chew on the other day, which he took from, from Carlia. And so she was able to get the halter on with no problem at all while he was chewing that but she doesn't think that's the answer. Um, she has tried the neck rope, but she finds that that annoys him and he can be quite forward. Once the halter is on, he's pretty good at leading, um, though he'll still catch the lead rope and chew on it when he's a bit anxious or wants to go to a different direction or eat grass. What do you recommend to help him get through this chewing stage? Should she just persevere and make the biting unavailable or is there another approach that could help him? Um. Just at this clinic at the moment, <clears throat> we're dealing with a little, uh, I think, 13-month-old, or big, actually, 13-month-old horse. He's looking to be a monster when he grows up. But, um, And the biggest thing that we're working on with him, and this will be the same with your horse, is just being quiet. Just, um, like I said, getting in that sort of educational frame of mind and he's got all these like, oh, what's over there? Shiny things. Oh, I'm going to run off. There's a bit of a something, not, you know, worrying me. Or... So basically, you know, every lesson has been more structured around. Well, actually, there's one other specific thing, but it's it's, it's not necessarily related to to your question. But um, but we're trying to get him just to stand quietly, and that's something that you have to sort of really think about. So. Um, don't go in to put a holder on him. Go in to get him to stand quietly. Okay, so all that stuff's going to happen without the holder on him. You know, you know he's going to come over. He's going to fidget. He's going to fiddle. He's going to kind of nibble and 
and by you going up and going straight to him wanting to catch him or something like that is only you coming at him like you know to do something so of course he's going to be in that frame of mind to go oh you know something you know there's something coming to me to you know so I'm going to be like that too so um, you know, so we, we, we actually want to just go out to sometimes those young horses that are like that, those coldy ones that are kind of very playful and very mouthy and just say, hey, can we just stand quietly? And then you go away. So imagine him if he was playing with horses. Imagine if a horse in a herd that couldn't stop playing with horses. But the horses are, you know, you've got to think of a herd being 24 hours so it's a 24-hour lesson in a day, isn't it? So, so basically, they, they, they'll play for a bit, but then they'll get over it, and then they'll sleep under a tree, and they'll all be standing around quietly. There's not a horse that just plays all the time. So you have to go out and spend some time with him and actually be one of those horses that says, I'm standing still now under the tree resting. Stop fiddling. So you go out there to show him, how you're going to stand and I'm going to stand calm. I'm just going to go and stand. He's going to come over. He's going to get curious and you're just going to stand there and you might be, you know, checking a fence post out or, you know, whatever. And he's going to come over and go, and you're going to go, let that thought go. And you're just going to do something like another horse would do. Has to like bang your leg. Well, another horse is not going to bang its leg, but you're going to do something to distract him and say, oh, that's not available. I don't want you to do that. And it's just to change his thought. And then you just stand quietly and lead by example until he goes, oh, oh, right, eh? And then when he softens and he just calms down a bit, you might just put your hand out, let him sniff, but you go in very quietly and, and, and very respectful of his space because you're leading by example. So you're saying to him, I'm respecting your space and I'm just going to come in softly and you can sniff on me and then you're just going to go, okay, now I'm going to go away and do something else. And just do some lessons where you go out and say, I need you to be emotionally just in a nice, calm place. No, no, no playful thoughts. Just stand peacefully, um, and 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 he'll start to recognise that peaceful frame of mind around you. And then um, it's that frame of mind that you start to sort of educate a horse from. So basically. If you're putting the holder on when he's all blah, 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 then you're going to have to always correct that behaviour. So then you go in softly so you can touch him in different places. This is without the holder, without him getting all nibbly and, you know, over-engaging and stuff like that. So you can touch and you go, you touch and go until he can be touched softly and realise it's not engaging stuff and playful stuff because those cults just think every touch is an opportunity to play or something like that and... Uh, and we, we don't want them to think that all the time because then it's just really annoying. So the other thing you can do is is when he, you know, you can walk away from a horse if they come and go blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, this is before you put the holder on. You walk into the, the paddock with him and he comes over and he, then you just walk away. And then he goes, oh, she didn't really want to play with me. And then you just stand there, he'll come over again. And then you go, oh, I'm going to go over here if you're going to keep doing that. And he's going to go, oh, why don't you do that for? And then after a while, he'll recognise that, oh, maybe she doesn't want to, you know, play with me. Maybe maybe I'll just be quiet, okay? And then when he's quiet, well, he can get he will stand with you close and he, he'll be fine. So, yeah, just, just try and sort of get that good frame of mind. And then I think you should teach him to lead to a neck rope because he doesn't like it. It needs to lead, to a neck, uh, lead with a neck rope because that's the, that's the lead rope that you put around his neck to say yield. So, so basically, once I've, I've sort of got them standing quietly, I'd be putting the neck, a lead rope around his neck and getting him to yield softly and then take it off and then put it on the other side, yield softly, just come across a little bit, take it off. Um, and then when he's in that good frame of mind, you'll probably be able to slip that holder on um, and it'll be a lot easier. But just try and, you know, but if, if there is times when he's just starting to sort of get a bit funny, just let go of that thought but building good habits become good habits because so so basically you 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 teach him that habit and he'll find that frame of mind easier to get into because he's been in it and he understands it and 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 he and and then he'll yeah it'll just become like whatever you do is what you learn so the more you go and stand and get him to be present and just calm that'll be 
starting to be the horse that he becomes. Um, but you have to sort of make that happen. That's fantastic. Um, okay, so the next question is from Claire. Just jumping from from one uh, thing to another today, but this is, um, she, her question is: Can she get a horse to stay in a float longer than thirty seconds? She has a gelding who walks on and off the float uh, quite well. He used to self load. He always travelled well, but after an incident um, a few months ago, he bumped his head. It wasn't a big thing, but she's starting to worry that actually it did upset him. So now he can walk on and off quite well, but he won't stay in for longer than 30 seconds. Okay. So a subject, I'm talking about the clinic I'm on because it's the, <laughs> the uh, I have to always talk about the, the, the clinic that I'm on because I do so many clinics that I, that's the one that rem I'm remembering the most. <laughs> so it's so fresh. yesterday, the, mm. yeah, it's fresh in my mind. So yesterday the subject came up and I was talking about how uh, pressure is always increased. You know, in training, horses, pressure is always increased. People always start slow and then they build up and then eventually they get big enough to worry the horse into doing something. And it's a very common thing. Most of the horses I come across, everyone started with, like, for instance, like driving pressure. I started with the feel of a rope and then I stepped in a bit and then I got big with the flag until the horse spooked enough to move away. And what we're not realising is by doing that, we're setting up the horse to start to have a lot of negative anticipation when things are quiet because it always builds up to an apocalypse. And then you end up with a horse that was going in a float until there was a bit of an apocalypse and now he's scared of the apocalypse. But if the apocalypse happened first and you so. A lot of horses that are uh, anticipating something and, and, and start to get really worried, um, we have to not go from little to big. We have to sometimes go from big to little because that means, and, and, and the psychology behind it is uh, if you went into a job interview, sorry, what if I, I could ask everyone listening, where what's worse for them the anticipation the night before the job interview and the night and the sleepless night of no pressure at all there's no pressure but the job interview is the next day and and you're really nervous about it so the the dry mouth the sleepless night the everything that goes before that job interview now say in that job interview the, the people who are interviewing you smiled and they were like, yeah, should, yeah, and you got that really good feeling in there. All of a sudden, you were really nervous halfway through the interview, but then all of a sudden, there was a, there was a change in that interview that you thought, oh, I feel good. You'd walk out of that interview and you'd have this feeling of like, oh, I feel really good and you'd be really happy and, um, and you've been through the apocalypse. So basically, after the apocalypse is when you sometimes get softness. And, and good feeling, and that's the same with horses. So I'm not saying everyone go and <laughs> make an apocalypse and scare the life out of your horse and saying, look, I can make you feel better after it. But a horse that's not found softness in some sort of mini apocalypse in its mind and not found clarity will always anticipate it. And whenever you're under that apocalypse, it's always going to be waiting for it. And that's what happens in floats. That's what happens with horses that have been ruined with driving pressure. That's what happens with a lot of horses. There's a horse at the clinic I've been working. And I had to create apocalypse, a little apocalypse to him and then say, now I'm going to lead you through this and make you feel good. And he goes, oh, God, I'm not scared of apocalypses anymore. I'm, I'm actually, and, and all that pressure underneath that apocalypse becomes like, oh, because he was scared of little bits of pressure, let alone the big bits of pressure. So every pressure under that big thing that he was probably anticipating became easy to deal with because it was below that. It was after the interview. So he was like, oh, I don't mind when you step there like that. I don't mind when you put a flag there. I don't mind when you do that because I've seen how bad it can get and it, and it didn't do anything to me and I found a way through it. So, oh, there's no threat in those other things. So the reason I'm going off on this bit of a tangent for you is 
is that's what's happening in the horse float. Your horse is waiting for that scary thing to happen and it's just like timing it, boom. It's, I want to get out before it happens. So you've got to make it happen first. I'm not saying bang his head with the horse float, but what I'm saying is you have to create a little conflict outside that horse float or a slightly bigger conflict where you you sort of maybe bang a flag, he pulls back, you hold him, you get him to lead forwards and backwards a few times and you stay in there till he starts to soften. And then you just go quiet again and go, right, now let's just lead a bit. Until when you create a, a, a bit of a spook response and he softens and then all of a sudden when you try and create that spook, spook response, he softens and goes, no, that's okay. Then you take him back to the float. He's already been through that. And then you just go, let's go softly one step back, one step forward, one step back, one step forward. Also on that float, before he even gets his head underneath that float, you have to speed that process up that he can do it in a bit of a hurry. Oh, I can get my feet on. I can get them off. I can get them on. That's leading in hand, I mean. Um, and until he can actually step up fast, step off fast, step up slow, step off slow, and there's just a nice loose softness in there that, that he can do it at different rain rope speeds or leading speeds. And he's confident with that. And then you can go really slow and just let him stand in different spots. You can let the rope go a little bit and let him sniff the float and engage with it, whatever. And then you go to leading again. And what will happen is he'll start to feel really good as he's coming out of those little sort of fast movements and he had to, he was, he was challenged a little bit. But what, what you're ultimately doing is you're helping him survive one of those uh, or have tools when one of those big things happen he can get through it without getting hurt, um, bumping his head. He, he can get through all that and find the other side. So once he can get through those things, he's got more confidence to make better decisions when he's all the way in the float. And um, and and that's and then and then I'd start to work on now stand for a little bit, good. Now come out, go in for a little bit, come out, and show him that he can go in soft and you can take him out soft. Um, and yeah, he'll just get better and better at, at dealing with that because um, he'll have been to the job interview and, and he'll be on the aftermath of it and, and he'll, 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 he'll soften a lot more. Changing a horse's thought, um, Mark, this is from Natalie. She was in a clinic in Wagga recently. You were getting her to work on changing her horse's thoughts by offering her horse a new direction whenever he has strong thoughts and to keep doing that. Is that a exercise that she should be persisting until he gets the idea even if it's a hundred times in a row or should she just be doing it every few times that she rides changing a horse's thought is basically all we're doing when we're working horses so basically you're doing it all the time uh, if a horse is walking in a straight line and you pick up on the reins, it will let go of that forward thought and think backwards, for instance. If you're riding along on a straight line and you pick up the left rein, the horse lets go of that straight line and thinks left. So really, um, it's something we're doing all the time. It's not something we just do a little bit of because it, if the horse is trained, it's always changing its thoughts when we offer a suggestion. So uh, we're doing it all the time ultimately anyway. The, the reason we do it more is because the horse is not letting go of those thoughts. That's why we have to do it more. So um, what? So to, for you to know how many times to do it is you've got to work out, is your horse present? Is it in the environment that you're in emotionally? Or is it leaving emotionally? Is that little bird flying away over the horizon? Um, so basically, if those thoughts aren't hovering and adjustable, well, you have to do something about it. Otherwise, destinating is the habit that the horse is, you know, building and falling into. So um, you're interrupting the thought, but you're interrupting the thought that is the thought that's leaving, not the one that's just present and walking softly. So when you get to a stage that your horse is just walking softly, you just sometimes pick up a rein and if an ear flicks and the horse is aware, well, you know you're doing your job, the, you've done your job and the horse is, is very good at kind of tuning in when, when, when you sort of um, offer a suggestion. So 
you'll always test that to make sure it works. If it's working, you're not doing anything because you're just testing it sometimes, but every time you steer, the horse steers correctly and backs correctly and does all that, so it's actually doing it all the time. So if, you, you know, when you say, do I have to do it 100 times, well, if your horse is constantly leaving every time you're doing something, well, you do have to do it uh, until the horse is not leaving all the time every time. It's 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 you know you're riding it or something like that. So you'll be you'll be saying let go of that thought, and then you might. But but what I, what I would probably do is is maybe reset the, the the horse by getting it to let go of a thought and just get, letting it stand for a little bit and say right now let's try again. Okay, so um, yeah, so you but you've just got to analyze and work out what how hard that thought is and is it adjustable. If it's not adjustable, you have to work on it. And you just got to monitor that all the time. My horse is not adjustable. I've got to make it adjustable. Or those thoughts aren't adjustable. I've got to make them adjustable. Um, and when they're just nice and adjustable, the horse is nice and flowy, then, you know, you can have a bit more free time because, because the horse is doing it for you. They become responsible. Um, on another sort of, you know, similar on a similar subject, but just another way of looking at it as well. There was a horse yesterday that was a strong destinator, so I did what I would sometimes do is when she got that march and that destination thought, you know, I got her to pick up the reins, back up till the horse let go of the strong thought. And I'm like, no, nah, we've got to teach this horse to walk softly. I'm not going to let it just march and then say let go of that thought. I'm going to say this is how I want you to think. So that was obviously very important for some horses. So basically she didn't know how to steer that well. So I just worked on holding the rein and holding the rein until she balanced. And all that tightness, that tension, that everything that was in her mind started to dissipate and she started to go, I've let go of all that fight. I'm going to follow the rein. So I just sat on her in the one spot or well, wherever she ended up shifting to until she finally let go of that strong thought and she went, I can follow that rein and I can just step softly and look into a rein. Then I let her out and she just melted into the ground and just sniffed the ground, plodded around whatever pace you put her in, purely because what I was originally asking her or asking the rider to do was something she hadn't done. So I said to her, we have to teach her what, how to be soft and and before we can ask her to be soft. So teaching her to let go of a strong thought, backing up, resetting and walking her off. She didn't know how to walk off soft. She didn't know how to walk off present. She just walked off. Um, so getting her to let go of the thought, she'd let go of it for a bit, but then as soon as you asked her to go again, she'd throw it out over there over the horizon. So I said, you have to learn how to step softly and not throw your thoughts out so far when, when, when you start to to move and then yeah basically after that you know she was very adjustable she, she she sniffed the ground she soaked up the air around her she sort of soaked up the environment she was in purely because she let go of that I'm, I'm going somewhere else so maybe that's also something people have to look at and you have to look at with your horses how soft can I get this horse how, how can I show this horse how to do it correctly before I say now let go of that thought and be like this you got to show them how to be. Okay, my last question for this session is from Cassie, and it's about unpacking stress. She's been working with her new gelding, the one that didn't like her catching if she had a halter in her hand and started windsucking when he was tied. Um, you helped with that on a previous Q&A session. And she said that uh, your advice has improved things dramatically. You were right that he was internalizing stress. Thank you for your help. She's noticed now, though, that since doing work with him to help unpack some of these things, that when she rides him out, he doesn't feel as relaxed in his body as he did when she first got him. He was always a bit lucky and he always felt relaxed in his back, but now he's becoming a lot more spooky and nervous with things when she takes him to places, whereas before he was OK and he was actually one of the best horses. So she's had him now for a total of five weeks. Um, she came off him, unfortunately. She He spooked pretty badly. She tried to reassure him mid-spook that everything was okay, but he wasn't listening and she ended up coming off. 
Um, he did just stand there after that, though, after she fell. So um, do you have any suggestions on where to go with his spooking? Should she just not take him out anymore? He does get quite bored in the arena, so she does like to mix things up. And can you just explain why he might be more spooky now that she's starting to unpack his stress? Yeah, well, the one one thing, and I'm, I'm not I'm not trying to challenge what 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 you're saying, Cassie, in this, but the one thing I um I'm interested in that when I read your question, I was like, he's unpacking he's unpacking his stress, but when he rides out, he used to feel soft in the back. Now he's not soft in the back, and I'm kind of curious about that because um. Some of the horses that I've come across that have been sort of shut down a bit and, and just kind of hide away, internalise a bit, they kind of just go through this kind of tunnel. So they're not, they don't seem as spooky. They just kind of just go on their thing. And when you open them up and they start to have, they realise that they're responsible for themselves and everything like that, and then they start to go, oh, gee, you know, everything's out there. They start to become more aware, which potentially could make them more spooky. Some actually become more aware, but they, they're actually less spooky because... They're taking on everything as they go, so they're prepared for those things a bit more. So some horses you unpack that that trouble in them. They become more looky, but they don't spook as much because they've told the person what they're worried about as they're going, whereas the one that internalises, sometimes they're walking through the tunnel until something big happens because they weren't aware of it. Their reaction is, could be huge. So their spookiness is sometimes worse. So what? But I think what's happened with yours is, he was walking through the tunnel of obedience and kind of blocking out all those things like, as I say, just internalising. I still think there would have been a spook in there if something big happened and it had all come out because all that worry is still in there and it's going to come out. But maybe you just never, uh, you know, had that moment when he was um, kind of shut down that, that, that something big enough happened to really, you know, unstick you or something like that. So, but I'm actually... What, what's... Uh, I'm finding hard is that he was soft in the back when he was shut down because it's 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 those two things don't go together really well like it's 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 really hard to have a, a soft horse that's internalizing so I'm, I'm i'm interested in in and I'm, I'm sort of unsure on the exact answer for this because my gut feel his back's tighter now because he's noticing everything so he's like twitchier and he's a lot tighter so i'm guessing that his back felt better when he was a bit shut down because he wasn't twitching all the time and sort of like this. But I wouldn't say he was soft in the top line. I'd say he was kind of still just better than he is now in the sense because he he was just going about like his business like a machine without twitching and, and, and getting sort of tired at everything. So, um, so... It's good that it's, though you, you, you've come unstuck and he spooked on you, and he's more spooky than he was. I think he had to go through that because I think he has to go through that because if he didn't, maybe the the, the accident that you ha would have had later on could have been a lot bigger or a lot worse when something big happens and, and it all comes out. And then after the aftermath of that can be a very fragile horse. So basically, you've got to go back to as if you were training him as a young horse. You've got to say to him, okay, well. Crikey, you know, I walk out the yards and you're like overwhelmed. So, so basically, the way you ride him is going to be very helpful for his confidence. So, a lot of people, you know, they put the legs on, they ride out, and the horse is just pushed out there, and then everything's overwhelming them. So, you've got to sort of grade that exposure into that sort of enemy territory. So, so basically, um, and and the other thing as well is. You can grade a horse's exposure to enemy territory, but riding them in the wrong way can still sort of keep them troubled. So basically, you know, I say to people when they're just getting horses to explore new territory that they haven't been in or just even getting out of the yards, is just use your reins and just let them kind of search a little. When they've searched, they've, they've assessed things, just take them back and bring them back to, to, to allied territory and then bring them out to enemy territory a bit and then bring them back to allied territory and just let them explore and know that they can move away from things. The other things uh, you've, got to ride, you've got to do when you're riding these horses is you've got to say, if you see something he's, caught, he's nervous about before he makes the decision to move away from it or something like that, 
as you feel him start to go, I'm concerned about that, you might just go, well, I'm going to take you over here a little bit away from it. So he goes, oh, that's good because if the rider wanted me to go past it, I would have spooked because they're pushing me towards that or near it. So by saying to him, you're free to go away from it if you want, before he spooks at it, he knows that that's available and it's going to make him more curious about the things that he's scared of because curiosity sometimes only, and it's the same in humans, curiosity sometimes only uh, is available when the back door's open. Curiosity is not available when the back door slams shut. So basically you become curious when you know there's an exit. I was talking to a lady who helps um, people in a bit of trouble at their homes and, and, and she's like a, you know, a, uh, like a mental health care worker, but, you know, she, she visits people in their homes and some of these people could be potentially very dangerous people and she can engage with those people and be very confident in that room, but she has a plan when she walks in and she's always at the door when she starts the conversation and, and she stays at the door. And she has a lot of success with these people, but she knows safety's there. She can run out that door and go to a car in, 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 a, in a moment. Um, and that's the same with horses. You have, to, you have to show that horse that I will take you away from danger and I can and you can take yourself away from danger if you want. And then all of a sudden all those things that were potentially dangerous, the horse starts to become more curious about because really most of those things aren't going to hurt the horse. There's only little spooks out there. The other thing in your training in the yards with him now is open, you have to heighten his awareness, you have to create a spook and then create a pathway in your groundwork, doesn't matter what it is, you might get a flag, you might spook him a little with the flag, and then you might lead him till he's soft. Until he's exposed to little exploding boxes in training, and that box explodes, and then you soften him. Until the exploding boxes don't worry him as much, because he's, he's made a good decision. So you have to expose them to those little spooks, show them a pathway, show them, uh, you know, how to feel better, and then they get better at dealing with those spooks so they become more available to be helped when those random things pop out when you're riding him. And that's that's also what you really want to look into. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. There's some some real gold nuggets in the, the today's session, um, you know, for what I've taken from it, um, building good habits and getting horses in the right frame of mind to be educated um, calming the mind is is really the key i hope you've all enjoyed listening to mark's specific answers which are always so well explained and peppered with all of his practical advice remember you can watch a lot of what he's talking about online with the online videos that's what they're there for is to really sort of show you these these answers as, as you know as he's doing it himself with the horses so that they're, they're on there for you over 500 training videos but for now, thank you, Mark. I know you got to go and teach. I'm conscious of not holding you up and people need to come in and use the kitchen that you're in. So thank you for your time this morning and, um, and we will talk to you again very soon. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, everybody. You can learn more from Mark and his approach online through his online training videos. Just search Mark Langley Horsemanship. Join hundreds of others around the world making real progress, fixing problems and improving their relationship with their horses. There are now over 500 training videos. Make use of the seven day free trial and take a look. Membership is just $15 a month and you get to ask Mark a question.